So I'm going to assume, first of all, that most everybody here would consider yourself an environmental activist or an environmentalist. An environmental activist, you could say, is a person who hears the distress call of the natural world, of a place, and feels compelled to respond. So if a canyon is splayed open for mining, or a creek is fouled with waters from hydrofracking, or a community is, it's decided that a community needs to have a plastics plant or an incinerator, or the glaciers are melting. An environmentalist feels compelled to get out there and do something and take action. And there are many ways of taking action. This is one, the, uh, the healing march for the tar sands, demonstrating, getting out there with signs, raising your voice, letting people know that this matters. There are those who litigate, who try to get Congress to pass different laws. Uh, <clears throat> they're lobbyists. The, the litigators try to get corporations and developers to uh, accept responsibility for injustices they've done and to pay up and to make restitution to people they've harmed. Conservationists will buy up big tracts of land in order to protect them and the species that live on them. And restorationists will try and fix up places that have already been damaged. Educators teach people from kindergartners <coughs> up through adults about the ecosystems they live in and how to take care of them. And artists take uncommon approaches to common problems. This is a, one about showing the disappearing species. I believe in Hawaii. And a lot of these actions are focused on cleaning up the messes that, have already, that are already existing, or looking into the future and trying to find ways of preventing worse messes. And when we do that, we often end up ignoring the places that are right in our midst that are damaged. We will either go out of our way to avoid them. Um, I remember a story that someone told me about a farm family in Kansas. And this farm had been in the family for three generations. The couple who owned it were getting older, and so they sold the farm. And when their daughter, who was living in California, came back home with her little baby son, they wanted to go over to the farm and kind of introduce the farm to the baby. The daughter wanted to see it again. And when they got there, there were, they found out that this whole, the canopy of trees that used to go over the whole road on both sides had all been cut down. And the couple felt so horrible about this, so guilty, that from then on they would go for miles out of their way in order to avoid the, the place. They just couldn't deal with it. Sometimes we feel like these places that we've loved that have disappeared have just abandoned us. It's like they went and they betrayed us. And another way of sometimes dealing with these issues is that we get so focused on fixing them that we forget to actually be in them. We'll spend all of our time at our computer or on the phone or talking to people and being in a state of anxiety and anger, which is absolutely normal, and yet the places themselves, we kind of just forget about them. We, we are, we're not able to be present in them. The Australian philosopher, Glenn Albrecht, an activist, author, and philosopher, coined this term, solastalgia. The full definition is the pain one feels when the place where one lives and that one loves is under assault. And he himself sometimes defines it as the homesickness you feel when you're still at home, when your place has left you. And people he points out, have a, a severe psychological, emotional, spiritual reaction when something happens to the places they love. It's not just about science. It's a deep, deep emotional pain. Back in the early 70s and the late 60s, we were all very moved when the astronauts sent back pictures of Earthrise, this beautiful blue and white planet floating in that 
black velvety space. And that picture, as Bill McKibben tells us, has changed now. There aren't so many fluffy white clouds. There are fewer white glaciers. The desert is spreading out over the land. Cities are spreading out over the desert. And in fact, in his recent book, McKibben spells Earth with two A's, E-A-A-R-T-H. He says that this planet has changed so much that it's become unrecognizable. It's not the planet we think we know anymore. And so we have to change its name. It's not the same planet. But is that really the best response? Is it really not the same planet? If we have a friend who's ill, are we going to change their name because we're assuming that they're not the same person anymore? Do we ignore that person because there's nothing we can do perhaps to heal them? Or do we go and we spend time with this person and get to know what they're going through now? How are they dealing with it? How are we dealing with it? Maybe we're honest about this. Maybe we bring them gifts when we come. Maybe we just sit by their bedside and be in the present, be in the situation. We are also intimate with places. We have the same kind of intimacy with places as we have with people. The places from our childhood, from our adulthood, they linger in us. They form who we are and how we think about their, ourselves. They often will give us concepts of justice and compassion and tenaciousness and struggle. They form our spirituality. When we think of major events in our life, they're often tied with places where we first fell in love, when we heard some really bad news when we had an important realization. They're tied up with these places. And so when something happens to these places, we feel a deep personal loss. So how do we deal with that? How do we keep on working for change, working for the better world we all want, and not go crazy with where we live right now and what's happening to the world we live in right now? We need to expand our idea of what an environmental activist is. We've already got a good idea of it, but how do we expand it so that we can live more fully and completely with where we are now? We need an environmental activism that is handy, that's like a little toolbox you can carry around with you no matter where you go, that you can have at hand any time, any place, no matter where you are. It kind of, would be a kind of activism where you don't have to join a group. You don't have to get, give money. You don't have to mobilize. You don't have to um, call people up at dinner, strangers. You, you just would have it no matter where you are, and you could do it in a way that would take a day or a week or an hour or just a few minutes. We need a kind of activism that is rooted in the present so that we are living where we are and being where we are right now, even as we are focusing very hard on making the world a better place in the future. And we need to expand our activism so that we acknowledge and accept the grief that we feel when something happens to the places we love. Often, the tendency has been to try and ignore it, scientists especially. I know scientists, and they'll say they try to keep those feelings to themselves because it's just not professional. You have to deal with facts. Other times, people do admit grief over places, and they're accused of anthropomorphizing. Anthropomorphizing, of course, means that you're attributing human feelings to a non-human, but it's gotten so sort of morphed out that people it's, it's as if you're anthropomorphizing when you're expressing your own feelings about a place. And we need a way of transforming sorrow, just feeling it. There's an increasing number of books and papers and articles coming out now about needing to accept grief. But what do we do once we have it? We have to transform it. You can't live in it. And we need a kind of environmentalism that says we're focusing on the small and the close by as much as the big 
sometimes called the, the, the charismatic megafauna, and the distance. So that what's right here and right now in our own backyards is as important and worthy of attention as what's far away in the, in the Arctic. And we need an environmentalism that can be fun, that can bring people together and be creative and compassionate and a way for people to have fun together. So one way to do this is to pay attention to wounded places in a different way. In 2008, I was the founder of this organization, Radical Joy for Hard Times, founded it with several other people. And the mission is to find and make beauty in wounded places. One of the ways that we do this, the primary practice, is called the Earth Exchange. And it's a simple four-part practice, which I'm going to tell you about. Um, and every year in June, this year it's June 20th, we have an event called the Global Earth Exchange. It's called Earth Exchange because part of this is, the part of the idea of this is that we have an exchange, that the places in our lives have given a great deal to us, so how do we give something back to them? That's the symbol for this year's event. So people have gone all over the world for this Earth Exchange and made simple, creative acts on this day. And I can talk more about that later if it comes up. But so the four steps of this simple process are go to a wounded place, share the stories of what the place means to you, get to know it as it is now, and make a simple act of beauty. So each one of these steps could be taken on its own, and they could all go together. And any one of them could do something to change our relationship with these places in our midst. So the first one is, go to a wounded place. And what a wounded place is depends entirely on the individual. It could be, and has been in some of our events, a family home that burned down. It could be, and has been, the town of Fukushima where people did an event. Um, it could be, uh, and has been, a bomb crater in Kabul that just exploded two days before we had a global earth exchange two years ago. It could be a super fun site. It could be the plastics factory that's smelling up your neighborhood. It could be, uh, it could be a clear cut forest or a polluted stream. It could be anything that you consider a wounded place. And it's important to actually go there, to be there. Sometimes people will say, well, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll sit at home and we'll meditate and we'll send healing thoughts to the place. Is that okay? Like, because we have a t-shirt? Because we have t-shirts every year for this. And that's not, it's not the same thing. It's a great thing to do if you want to sit at home and have healing thoughts about a place. But it's different from actually going there. Because the idea is to get re-rooted, to establish a relationship, to re-establish a relationship with these places. So that's the first thing. And obviously, it's the step that most people find the hardest thing to do. How do I just go and face something that is so painful? How do I just go and sit with it and see what's there? Obviously, there's a lot of reluctance. But when people do it, and they're there for just a little while concentrating, they find that their attitudes really change a lot. They find that they are bolder and more courageous than they thought they were, because they face this thing that they thought they were afraid of. They find that the terrible sense of despair and doubt that they thought they were going to fall into, despair and, and, and dread, it's not really quite as bad as they thought. They find out that they're able to deal with something in a way that they weren't sure that they could deal with. And they feel empowered. So the second step is share the stories of what the place means to you. This means that when people go to this place, they take some time to sit together and talk about their relationship with this place. How long have they been there? How long have they lived there? How, did they, how long ago did they visit, visit it? Um, how do they feel about it? What are some memories? Even if it's a first time event for some people, you can simply give your first impressions of the place. And this telling of stories kind of reanimates the place. It brings it back to life. It, uh, it reminds people that they have a relationship with it. And it opens up the heart. And wise people from different spiritual traditions, psychological traditions, they say that when the heart is opened up, even if it's opened up in pain, it, it releases something and it makes 
all of the energies in the body flow again so that we can feel more compassion, more creativity, and feel more empowered to act. The third part of the uh, practice of the Earth Exchange is to spend some time getting to know this place as it is now. So usually that will mean that people in the group uh, or individuals just take maybe 20, 30 minutes, sometimes even 10, to just walk around and see what's there. What calls to your attention? What's growing? What's thriving? What's not doing so well? And it's not about fixing it. It's just about noticing, seeing what's there, seeing where the life is. And often after this part of it, the people will come together again and tell the stories of what they noticed. So I'll tell you a little example about this. Uh, before I founded Radical Joy for Hard Times, and I was trying to figure out a way of how to do this, how to give attention to wounded places, I was at a conference in Virginia, and we learned that a forest of 14,000 acres had been burned in a wildfire. So we went there. And, uh, so, and then people got together, and then there were about a dozen people, and they all sort of went off on their own for about half an hour or so, and then came back together and stood in a circle because there was no place to sit down, told the stories. And one woman talked about finding a little sapling tree that was all burned and charred. And uh, she felt sorry for it because it had been killed, likely, before it was able to come to maturity. And as she stood looking at this tree, she suddenly had an image of her sister who was at that time undergoing radiation treatments for breast cancer. And her feeling of sorrow about the tree melded into sorrow for her sister. And she began to cry. And she knelt down by the tree and put her arms around it and sang it a lullaby. There was another man on this trip who saw a buck, a very emaciated buck, very slowly picking its way through the forest, nose close to the ground, slowly picking up its feet, very thin, trying very hard to find something to eat. And the man stayed at a distance and followed this deer the whole time they were out there and was amazed by the toughness and the, the indomitability of life, just this need to eat. And he had a lot of, he had respect, compassion, and, uh, and in, was inspired by this deer. Another woman went out and she was, in a, she was cross. She thought that I had been irresponsible at even suggesting this trip. She wanted to go home, but because we'd all carpooled, she couldn't. So she was forced to just be there and walk around. And while she's stomping around angrily, she noticed one little green shoot coming out of this black forest. I mean, it was black. And she got so delighted by this green shoot, she immediately looked around for somebody to share it with. Another guy actually picked up pieces of charcoal and painted his face and arms with them so that he felt like part of the, the forest. So this was just a, a brief time that these people had in this particular area and their individual responses to it. All completely different. Everybody's response was completely different. It wasn't all about grief at all. It wasn't all about sorrow or fear or despair or anger. All different kinds of reactions. So the fourth part of the Earth Exchange is to create art there, to create beauty, to give back a gift to the place. And uh, this is the part that, uh, to me, is really like the turning point of the whole thing. And it's not necessarily something that you come easily to. If you're going to a place and it's, uh, it's, it's damaged, it's toxic, it's ugly, it's not the way you want it to be, maybe the last thing you feel like doing is creating something beautiful there or giving something of yourself. But it's, it's a very interesting, I don't even begin to understand it, it's a very interesting thing that happens to people when they do this. And it's important to know that you don't need to be an artist. You don't need even art supplies. You don't need tools. You don't need to be an expert. You don't even need another person. You can do it all on your own. What we do is we make this act of beauty out of what's already there. And it's a way of affirming that no matter what a person has or no matter what a place has, it's enough. 
all of the ingredients are already there to transform something from being something that's maybe a little negative into something that's positive and beautiful. So um, this act of beauty could be anything. It could be singing or dancing or making an altar or saying a prayer or turning a cartwheel or hugging a tree or weeping over a tree and singing it a lullaby. For the Global Earth Exchange, we ask people to make a bird out of materials that they find on site. This is a group in Colorado. They went to a clear-cut forest. They made this huge bird, which I hope you can see. That's its head with its beak. And so every year, people come up with the most wonderful birds, including birds made out of trash that they then pick up and haul out. Because uh, we're, not the, we're not the only artists here. We're just the first artists. And after we do our piece, the sun and the wind and the rain and the animals and maybe other people and maybe traffic and time, they, they, are the second, they are the second artist. It's not about posterity. It's not about making it stay still so that people could come and admire it, although you never know who will. It's about creating something together. And everybody participates, old and young, abled and disabled. Everybody participates in making this, even if they just like stick the eye on the bird at the last minute or do whatever they do. And there's something very empowering about doing this. It's like realizing in the act of giving this, which is often offered as a gift back to the place, thanking it for all it's given, um, even though it can't give what it used to be able to give. And perhaps it's also a gift of consolation. This partly, you're partly consoling yourself and you're partly consoling the place because it just can't do what it used to be able to do. It's, it's, it's been asked to do things that other places haven't been asked to do. And this is true just as much for a neighborhood or a hospital wing as a, as a, as a clear-cut forest. In psychology, we are told that it's important to acknowledge and get to know and accept those parts of ourselves that we don't like so much. Maybe we're a little ashamed of them. Maybe there are parts of us that we don't necessarily want other people to know about. They're called, Jung called them the shadows. And the, the psychologists tell us that we have to get to know these shadows and to embrace them and to find out how they've served us and then transform them. And if we don't do that, we won't be whole, healthy, integrated people. And the same is true for places. How can we, as environmental activists, create the thriving, equitable, sustainable earth that we want if we are ignoring some of these places and pushing them out of our lives? And by the way, to say that we're accepting these places as they are right now does not by any means does not in any sense mean that we are just capitulating and rolling over and saying, okay, you can do whatever you want here. It does not mean that at all. It's simply saying, this is how things are now. It's like holding a balance. This is how it is now, and this is how I want it to be. And I have to be in both. I have to have both my feet down at the same time. It's a very, very difficult balance, especially when you're in a, an active crisis of a situation. But how do you do it? How do you hold that balance? One way is this very simple way of giving beauty to wounded places. This is a picture of the frog prints. And the relevance here is that over and over again in myths and fairy tales, we hear stories about how when people step out of what they think they know and they give compassion and attention to that which is ugly and undesirable, that ugly and undesirable thing changes, but also the person himself or herself changes. So the princess kisses the frog and he turns into a prince. The young man, the young brother, uh, helps an old woman at the well by giving her water when his two supposedly smarter older brothers just ignored her. And she turns into a princess or she turns him into gold so that whenever he speaks, gold falls out of his mouth. 
the message is that by stepping outside of ourselves and going one step further into a place that we're not quite sure we want to go and doing something extreme and outrageous and wild and bold and spontaneous, we ourselves are transformed. So perhaps you're saying, how does this, how does this change global warming? How does this bring back all of those African elephants that are losing their tusks? How does this change the world? On its own, it doesn't. And that's why we still need to do all of those things that I mentioned earlier that we're already doing. However, it can and could be, and I would say from my point of view, should be incorporated in all kinds of other activism. So for example, you have a group that's working very hard to save a, a canyon that they love. And so maybe once a week or <coughs> once or twice a week, they get together in a big circle and they talk about, every individual person has time to talk about what this place means to them and why they're doing the work that they do. They're bringing themselves back into being in relationship to this place. Or perhaps a group is restoring a forest. And at the end of their restoration work, maybe they do a simple creative act of beauty there. Um, I heard a story on the radio after Hurricane Sandy about a man in New Jersey who lost, his whole home was destroyed and he had to move, uh, he was living on one of the barrier islands, he had to move onto the mainland. And he never changed his, uh, he never changed his mailing address. So every day he would drive over to that old mailbox and get his mail. And to me this is one of those kinds of acts of beauty. It's just like maintaining his relationship with that place, even though his heart is broken because everything was lost. So these simple acts of beauty are possible for everybody to do at any time. And we often hear about the pebble that drops into a pond. Typically when we talk about this image, the focus is on the ripples. You throw that pebble into the pond, the ripples go out, you never know what kind of effect it's going to have. You're only the pebble dropper. So I look at this act of making beauty and going to wounded places and paying attention to them and giving them care as the splash. It's that first splash. It's that throwing that pebble into the pond. It's that bold action. It's that first splash, that wildness that sense of I'm doing this simply because I love this place, I care about it, I have to do something right now, I have to do something immediately in the present, even as I'm working for the future. And I want it to be a strong statement. So I'm gonna go there, I'm gonna tell my stories, I'm gonna see what's there now, and I'm gonna create beauty. And that is one of the ways that we can be environmental activists, listening to nature in distress, and taking actions. Thank you.